My name is Christy, and I am 39 years old. I live in Harrison County, Ohio. In the summer of 2011, my friend was staying in a tent in my yard for roughly two months. She said that she could hear something big walking toward her tent. Then, one night, I was in the house on Facebook around 2 a.m., and my girlfriend was on her laptop in her tent on Facebook. She messaged me to come outside right away. Something was sniffing loudly, breathing heavy, walking around her tent. I walked outside, thinking she was just freaking herself out, thinking she was just hearing things. I even kind of laughed it off, opened the door, and yelled if she was okay. She yelled for me to come to the tent, so I grabbed a flashlight and walked down. I didn't see anything. If there was something there, it ran away. I told her it was a deer, but she wasn't convinced. In the summer of 2012, both of my daughters, 16 and 17, came in the house after taking our dog out around 11 p.m., shaken and scared, saying they'd seen something really big when standing by our tree in the backyard which leads off into the woods. Then again, walking to the house up the driveway around midnight, they came in scared, said they had seen the same thing walking around our pool and then walked into the woods. I never really believed them. I tried to convince them that there was nothing there, that it was their imagination because they overheard my friend talking who camped in my yard. I told them the dog would bark and growl if something was out there. Then, on November 27, 2012, around 11.45 p.m., I took our five-month-old pup outside to go do his thing. I walked out the door, turned right with the pup on a leash toward the wood line, maybe 20 or 30 feet from the door. As I began to get closer, maybe three feet away, I heard something big shuffling in the briars. I turned, thinking it was a deer, and when I turned around, it stood straight up. It was very big, very tall and very wide. My guess would be at least seven feet tall. A very broad chest, which was all I could see, besides the outline of its body. It was very dark, and it blended right in with the darkness except the chest or stomach. Not sure which. It all happened so fast. As it stood up, that part of it was light and showed up in the moonlight. I screamed loudly, ran to the house, dragging the puppy behind me, which I don't believe the pup even realized it was there. It scared me so badly I was shaking and crying. My husband and 21-year-old son who also did not believe the stories from my daughter and my friend, went outside with a very small flashlight and a knife for protection to try and find out what it was. My son said it was still out there and that it was behind the tire swing. He seen its shadow and it ran from him toward the spring on the hillside, which is nothing but briars. He said he couldn't see it after that, but it was there because it quit running, but he couldn't see it or hear it. He had this eerie feeling it was staring right at him. They both came back inside, and my son had the exact same description as me. Very, very tall, very wide, but he only seen the back of it as it ran up the hill into the briars. My husband thinks it was curious, whatever it was, because it snooped around but ran anyway. I truly believe that it was indeed a Bigfoot. It was hanging around for over a year that we know of. I'm a 61-year-old and have been an outdoorsman all of my life, doing numerous backpacking and mountaineering trips in the Cascades and Olympics. I even have a degree in psychology and currently employed as an investigator my 15-year-old son and I made camp at twilight off of Road 25, 
after doing a recon of the Lewis River area for hunting. It is a rainforest there, with huge cedar trees and large moss-covered maples, reminded me of a rainforest. We set up camp on the east side of a creek, and we had my forerunner parked and set up a tent. After a wonderful steak dinner, I made some howls in the manner of the Ohio howls that I had made that had called in a Sasquatch. I'm a trained vocalist and can project my voice considerably. After no response, we retired for the evening. At around 10 p.m., we were awakened by a loud crack of a branch very close to our tent. I jumped out of my bag with a 400 lumen flashlight and searched 360 degrees, hoping I could spot the culprit. After several minutes and intense searching to no avail, we went back to sleep, only to be woken by howls off in the distance to the south of us an hour later. I would guess that the howls were coming from a single individual approximately a mile away from us. My son reported that he had heard the footsteps later near the tent that night, but failed to wake me. In the morning, my son discovered a single footprint near the tent. I have photos. It is a very wide, fright footprint size 13 that was very deep in the dirt, around half an inch. I am sure the print is still there, as it has not rained since, Despite a large rock in near the middle of the arch, the print is deep and was not affected by it. I cannot make a print at all, and I weigh 250 pounds. I have always been keenly interested in Sasquatch and was convinced that they exist after reading Dr. Meldrum's Where Legend Meets Science. I have had encounters after mimicking the Ohio Howl with remarkable success. I suspect the government has proof and is keeping quiet to protect this crypto hominid with wilderness area. I'm studying maps of an area I reason to be a prime habitat and have even planned a trip over land or off trail roads soon. I think it's time to get serious. This is an excerpt from a short story that I wrote about this hunting trip for mostly my family. I am 64 years of age and have 40 plus years in law enforcement. Currently, I'm serving as chief of police. With hunting season not to open until the day after next, we were in no hurry and enjoyed the evening with a touch of good single malt Irish, talking about our past hunts and the one we were about to have. Lloyd and Davis would not arrive until the first day of the hunt, presumably because Dave had become domesticate sometime after the previous year's hunt and had to attend a retirement party before being allowed to leave the Valdez for camp. With the evening expanded and the toll of the day that had taken on us, we were in our sleeping bags and doubtlessly turning logs into sawdust by 11 p.m., the stove was stoked with fresh firewood, and all was good. About 2.15 a.m., I awoke feeling way too warm, unzipped my bag, slinging the top off, when I heard a resounding crack of wood striking wood, similar to a Louisville slugger solidly striking a large, sound birch tree very close to the cabin. There being no one within many miles of us, my attention was now immediately focused on the sound. A few seconds later, the sound was repeated, which was to be the pattern for several minutes, while I attempted to evaluate it to determine its source. Finally, I decided to wake Bill, saying in just above a whisper, Hey, Bill. He stirred, responding with something that sounded like a what, and did not move again. For 20 minutes. When he woke up and asked what was going on. In the meantime, the commotion stopped when I initially attempted to wake Bill up again and was sitting on the bunk with my 450 in hand, waiting for whatever eventually might rise. 
and nearing 3 a.m., I finally returned to a sound slumber awake well into the following morning. With a spot of coffee in our gullets, and having explained to Bill the events of the previous night, we explored the area of the old village, inclusive of the nearby graveyard, in an effort to find an explanation. We found numerous paths traversing the grassy area, all around the cabins, with a multitude of bedding sites. Never did we find anything that would provide us with an answer to the question of the source of sounds. Explaining this to another friend after our return, with the experience of spending many years living in numerous villages, he asked me if there was a native graveyard nearby. It is less than 50 yards from the cabin. Nevertheless, I named the source Sassy, with a spot of coffee in our gullets, and having explained to Bill the events of the previous night, we explored the area of the old village, inclusive of the nearby graveyard, in an effort to find an explanation. We found numerous paths traversing the grassy area, all around the cabins, with a multitude of bedding sites. Never did we find anything that would provide us with an answer to the question of the source of sounds. Explaining this to another friend after our return, with the experience of spending many years living in numerous villages, he asked me if there was a native graveyard nearby. It is less than 50 yards from the cabin. Nevertheless, I named the source Sassy. Around 6.45 p.m. on April 23, 2008, as my son and I were coming into the U.S. from Canada, we were traveling west, about 14 miles on the U.S. side of the U.S.-Canada border, on the Alcan Highway. My son was driving. If you've ever driven the road, then you know how the pavement has huge dips in it. I suspect from the freezing and thawing of the foundation of soil under the pavement. Anyway, my son was watching directly in front of the car, just to make sure we took the smoothest path around some upcoming heaves in the pavement. I was watching further down the highway, as I had done on our entire trip. My hope was to catch a glimpse of a bear, moose, or some awesome wildlife of some kind. Anyway, we were on a slight descent down a hill, making a slight left corner and about to start up the other side when I saw what I thought was a human crossing the road, may three-tenths of a mile ahead of us, and up then, a very slight incline. He was a tall, odd-looking fellow, and I joked to myself when I first saw him, well, there's a Sasquatch up the road fully expecting to see that a person had crossed from a house, or something, on the left-hand side of the road, over to another house, or something, on the right-hand side. When we got to the point where the structure should have been, there was nothing. I mean nothing. And no sign of any human, animal, or anything else on the right-hand side of the road in the woods. This thing was walking upright, just like a man would, long arms, and what looked like a long neck from the side. It had a fairly long gape in his walk, arms swinging with each and every stride. It was all one color. I described it to my wife as the color of a Carhartt rust brown full coveralls. I called her first thing when we got self-coverage. She got on the web and saw where this was not the first time a sighting had happened in the very same area. I was so glad that somebody else had seen it. I hate to say it, but he looked similar to the representations on TV and pictures. And by the way, I have always thought this whole thing was a bunch of nonsense. If nothing else, someone was wearing a suit to make them look like the Sasquatch character. If you or someone you know has a story, encounter, or experience you would like to share with my viewers, please send it to my email at stories at whatlurksbeneath.com. Thank you.
It was about July 5th, 2015. It was late, about 3.30 a.m. I had fallen asleep on my cousin's sofa, about 10 p.m. after a long day at our family reunion. All of a sudden, the dog started going crazy. It woke me up, so I kind of laid there, thinking to myself, I wish they would shut up. Then, all of a sudden, I heard one of the dogs yell out like it was hurt. Then, I heard the sound of something coming up on the front porch, so I sat up to look out the front window. It just so happens that we left the porch light on, and what I saw was unforgettable and unbelievable. It was squatting down right in front of me. I guess it was too big to stand straight up on the porch. I don't know why it was there, but we had left the empty beer and soda cans and leftover food scraps and a couple of trash bags to be thrown out the next day. But to make a long story short, I was no more than eight to 10 feet away from it. I looked at it for what seemed like an hour, but I never actually saw its face because its back was to me the whole time and I never leave my 45 caliber. But for some reason, I did not have it with me this time. If I had, you would have had a corpse to show the world, but this thing has become aggressive in this area of Alabama where my family lives. July 8th, it kills my cousin's bulldog. In May, it chases another family member. In June, it looks into a family member's window in broad open daytime. So I'm trying to get some of the guys together and try and kill it because no one will do anything to research and capture this thing. We know where it lives and how it travels. All we want is for somebody to capture it and remove it. I live in Texas, but my family resides in Alabama, and they are living in fear of this thing, so it has to go one way or another. When my aunt was about 11 or 12 years old, she was helping her older cousin Jerry in the field at her aunt's house in an area they called Screamer in Henry County, Alabama. It was a hot day and after some time, Jerry grew very thirsty and asked my aunt to walk up the road to the house and get him a glass of water. My aunt then walked through the field back toward the dirt road leading to her aunt's house. Upon reaching the dirt road, she saw two creatures standing on the other side of the road. She stopped and began slowly backing up and then stopped again. She stood there looking at them and they looking at her for about a minute or so long enough for her to get a good look at them. They were only around 10 feet away from her at that point. She on one side of the dirt road, and they on the other. She described them as standing next to each other. One was, in her estimation, around five feet tall, and the other was slightly shorter, around four feet tall. She said that she got the impression they were young. She said that they were really hairy and completely covered in dark brownish black hair that they looked sort of like gorillas but with human looking faces with hair on them, human looking hands and human looking feet. She said their noses were free of hair and that the color of their noses was dark, brown or black as were their feet and hands. They stood very still other than blinking just looking at her. Except for being covered in thick hair, their faces looked human with regular human looking noses. After a minute or so, she took off running as fast as she could back up to the house to get water Jerry had requested. She did not look back as she ran. She got the water and proceeded to walk back toward the field. The creatures were not there anymore. She never told anybody about this incident until just a couple of months ago because she was always afraid people would make fun of her. This would have been in summer of 1953, with the nearest road being Highway 95. It was a few days after Hurricane Frederick. I was 11 years old at the time. We lived in a trailer on Hurricane Road, and my grandparents owned the Hurricane Landing and Fish Camp, what is now Perkins Landing. We were left without power after the hurricane, so all of our food was on ice. It was about 11 p.m., and my dad asked me to walk to my grandparents' store and get some ice. So I grabbed a flashlight and took off walking. It was less than a quarter of a mile from our house to the store, and I was already very used to walking the route on a daily basis. So I'm walking down the left side of the road, and I could hear the dogs barking and really cutting up. 
They belonged to an older man who lived in a little white house down the road on the right. He kept them in a pen behind his house. So when I get in the front of the house, I shine my light across the street, at and around the house. Suddenly, I see something very large run from behind the house on two legs. I followed it with my light as it ran towards the woods, and then it stopped and turned and looked at me. Its eyes glowed red in the dark, and all of a sudden, it runs straight at me. It was so fast. I mean, it traveled probably about 30 or 40 yards in just a flash, and then it stopped right at the edge of the road. I was scared frozen. I couldn't scream or run, and we just stood there for what seemed like an eternity, but in all actuality was probably just a second or two. Then suddenly, it let out a high-pitched growling sound, and then I screamed, and it turned and ran, and I ran all the way home. When I got home, I was so upset that I could hardly breathe or talk. My parents finally calmed me down, and I told them what happened, but they didn't believe me. The next day, my dad and my uncle went down there to look for tracks, but they didn't find any. My uncle told me I probably saw a bear, but even I know a bear can't run on two legs. The creature I saw was extremely large. I would have to say now that it was at least seven feet tall, very broad shoulders, covered from head to toe in dark brown to black hair. His mouth and large, square teeth kind of stuck out from the rest of the face, and the eyes were sunk in. As a veteran, I can tell you that I've never been so scared in my life. I have been reluctant to share my story because of my field of work, and do not want to have people think I'm crazy as this could severely damage my career. But as I get older, I feel this incident needs to be documented. The incident occurred in the winter of 1980, just a few miles east of Clayton, Alabama, in Barber County. I was traveling with my aunt, grandmother, and four younger cousins to a relative's house. It was dark and probably around 9 p.m. from the best that I can remember. For some reason though, my aunt needed to turn around and proceeded to pull off the roadway by a small clearing. I was in the front seat of the car with my aunt, who was driving, and my grandmother, as we turned off the road, the headlights caught a figure in mid-stride. It then immediately froze and did not move anymore. It was about 30 yards away from the car, very close. I could see the entire side view of this creature, and its body was slightly turned so that it was looking at us. The most terrifying thing in my memory is this thing's huge eyes glaring at us. The best way I can describe the creature's expression is stunned. The face was covered in hair except for around the eyes. The hair was dark and appeared longer and wavy looking on the arms and legs. It was very tall and massive, but yet also lean looking. I would say it was easily over seven feet tall, if not more. When it froze in the headlights, one arm was slightly extended behind the creature and it held this position. At this point, my grandmother was crying and begging for my aunt to drive away. Two of my younger cousins were huddled on the floorboard in the back seat crying. I was terrified but could not look away. My aunt kept telling my grandmother, there is no way he can get in this car. And she kept the car still and we watched this motionless creature for about two to three minutes. It was almost completely motionless. It was as if the creature thought we could not see him if he did not move. I don't know how it stood so still. The hair on my neck is standing on end as I type this. It scared me terribly. He kept staring at us with those eyes stretched very wide open. I'll never forget that look he gave us. Finally, my aunt decided to flash the lights on and off real quick. The instant that she did this, the creature jumped toward the woods and was gone. He was about 10 yards from the woods but made it there in less than a second. I can't believe how fast this huge creature could move. The event itself traumatized me. I have never been able to go into the woods alone or enjoy camping since this event. I tried to deer hunt but could not enjoy it and quit. I cannot sit alone in a tree stand without thinking of this creature and becoming tense. I can't imagine coming upon this thing alone in the wilderness. I know these creatures exist. There is no doubt in my mind. 
I saw one up close and personal. We never saw the creature again. My grandmother says that she and my late grandfather saw a strange creature near their home in the early 1950s. This home is located about four miles from my original 1980s sighting. She and my grandfather went out on the front porch late one night and saw a creature standing in the edge of the woods near the house. They could only see its chest and arms in the shadows. She said it was tall and hairy. My grandfather yelled at the creature and it ran back into the woods towards a stream and made a great deal of noise thrashing throughout the trees and brush. She said they did find some strange three-toed footprints the next day, but they never had another encounter with the creature after my incident. I was driving a VW bus, so I had a good view of my surroundings. As I rounded the first corner of the exit, I noticed what I thought was a big white dog, like an Afghan running on all fours towards the road, up on an embankment. We both reached the same point at the same time, and I thought I would hit the dog. It seemed it didn't notice my car until it reached the side of the road, when it was only feet away. I don't remember slowing much, but I wasn't going very fast to start with, as the curve was pretty tight. As the creature reached the road and I saw it, it stood up on its back legs. It was covered with long white hair, maybe eight inches long. It wasn't thick, but more stringy and dirty looking, and it had a round head, not a dog. I passed the creature and didn't catch it in my mirrors as it was dark. It scared me. I didn't get much detail of its face, but I did notice a fairly large mouth or lips which were very prominent. The head was not huge and the body was fairly slender. It was probably as tall as the VW when it stood up, well over six feet. On November 9th, 2008, a suspicious knocking was heard about 3 a.m. as my husband was camping with Boy Scouts on the side of a ridge southeast of Henderson Peak, about 200 yards from State Road 281. This is just south of the Chiaha State Park line. It was about 14 degrees with intermittent howling wind. There were three sets of two knocks each, about 100 yards north of the campsite described as a piece of firewood hitting another. It was very loud and the knocks, though themselves rhythmic, were spaced so that the wind died down before they occurred again. These were not little limbs hitting each other and he was not able to determine if there was any response because of the wind. There were no campers north of them and the only other campers on the mountain that were encountered was another Boy Scout troop camping about four miles away, directly on Lake Chinobi. My husband is an avid Bigfooter who awoke and immediately felt that this was consistent with other knocking activity. Due to the inclement conditions and not wanting to scare the younger kids in the camp, he did not have the chance to follow up. Although he didn't mention the sounds the next morning, another adult did, and with careful roundabout questioning, all other factors for the sounds were excluded, like trees falling, wind, limbs hitting each other due to the wind, etc. I am typing this since he was not sure of the cause of the sound and was reluctant to report something that may not have been genuine. There are other reports of activity in the Talladega areas and we know of one other not reported in Perry County. This particular sighting happened in July of 2007 and was about a one hour drive, shorter as the crow flies, from this incident. My husband also observed suspicious activity as a youth. 12 to 14 while hiking with his uncle somewhere in the vicinity of the Vincent County in the form of a huge noise about 40 yards from them as they stood in a creek and upon climbing out observed twisted branches about two inches thick and uprooted bushes which was taken as the huge sound they heard. He was not interested nor had knowledge of Bigfoot at the time. It affected them so much though immediately and they left the area. About seven years ago, my wife and I were at a lake in the middle of the Talladega National Forest in Alabama. The lake was Sweetwater Lake. We were fishing in a small boat at the end of a slough early in the morning. We were the only ones at the lake. I think it was on a Wednesday and we were all alone. We heard something scream. It started out as a howl 
and turned into a long, high-pitched scream, and it was so loud that it echoed through the mountains. It made the hair stand up on the back of our necks. But that is not all. About a year before that, my stepfather and I were hiking around the same lake. We liked to fish a spillway on the back side of the lake. About half a mile into the hike, we crossed a fire break about 20 feet wide. Now keep in mind that we are pretty good, way back in the woods. We have crossed rocks, thorns, and briars and all kind of rough ground. And right there across the dried mud in the fire break is a set of footprints dried into the mud. They were not huge, they were about the size of a full grown man, but they didn't look human. I just couldn't understand why a man would be this far back in the woods without shoes on. And over the years, there is one thing I have thought about a Bigfoot would have to grow up. So maybe it was a juvenile. At the end of January 2013, I was traveling north on Alabama Highway 51 in northern Coffee County in a rural area approximately one mile south of the Dale County line just before dark. I estimate the time to be around 5 p.m. As I approached a left curve, I noticed a large dark mass in the roadway. At this point, I was within 100 yards of it. Suddenly, it moved to my right and in about three steps, it was on the shoulder of the road facing me. It was a bipedal creature, approximately nine feet tall with a shoulder span approaching four feet with the most intense yellow green eyes that I've ever seen, spaced around six to eight inches apart. In my headlights, I could see it was covered in gray brown hair. The face was ape-like with dark brown, black leathery skin. This creature lifted its left arm, possibly to shield its eyes or perhaps anticipating being hit as I was about 30 feet from it. Then I was past it. It took several seconds for the significance of what had occurred to sink in. In 1979 and 1980, I was living in my grandparents' old home place on our family farm in Alabama. The farm was about 300 acres of woods, covering an area of deep hollows leading down to sloughs off a river. In late summer and fall of 79, we had been having trouble with deer poachers and some cattle rustling on our farm. So I was spending a lot of time out at night and on my off days trying to catch them. Several times at night and a couple of times during the day, I had heard strange screams back in the woods towards the river. The first time I heard them, I thought it might be a peacock or a screech owl, but it really didn't sound like either and it seemed to be much louder and much more prolonged. I really didn't think much of it until one night I was walking back to the house from the back of the farm at about 11 p.m. It was a clear night with a bright half moon shining and I could see quite well. I was skirting along the south edge of the woods, about a half mile due north of the house, when suddenly I got a creepy feeling that I was being watched and or was in danger. My skin started crawling and the hair on the back of my neck and hands stood up. At the same time my dog, a large Doberman pincher, started acting nervous and whining quietly and started looking back over his shoulder to our left towards the wood line. I eased the safety off my rifle and increased my pace. Right at that instant, something screamed right on the edge of the woods less than 35 yards behind and to the left of us. The pitch and volume of the scream was incredible. I could feel my chest vibrating from the loudness of the scream. My dog and I both broke and I ran to our right into the pasture, about 50 yards, and I spun around and stopped with my rifle up to see if it was chasing us, but it wasn't. I stood there with my rifle up, and whatever it was screamed at us five or six more times. Also, I could hear movement in the dry leaves where the sound was coming from. It sounded like a large person pacing back and forth. I could also see the tops of some saplings and the small trees sway and move as it bumped into them or pushed and pulled on them. The screams were longer lasting and a little lower pitched than what I had heard before. I also know for sure that they weren't bobcat screams. I became aware of the sound of our cattle running away towards the southwest. The woods got quiet, but I knew it was standing there, still watching me, but I never saw anything. 
I backed away for about a hundred yards and then broke into a jog back to the house, spinning around and stopping with my rifle up and about every 50 yards or so, just to make sure it wasn't following me. A few nights go by. I was up late, 1.30 a.m., and getting ready for bed. I came out of the bathroom into my bedroom, and my dog was standing there, staring towards the front of the house. He was completely stiff, with the hair standing up on the back and the neck, and he was growling very low and menacingly. It was the only time I have ever seen him do that, and he was deadly serious. I got a glimpse of a shadow move across the corner of my front bedroom window, moving towards the west side of the house. The moon was shining right on the west wall of the house. My dog turned towards the west and kept growling even more seriously. Then I saw a large, sort of human-shaped shadow move across both windows on the west side of the house. The dog kept turning and growling and following the shadow. Whatever it was, had to have been about 10 feet tall to cast a shadow that far up on the windows. I was petrified with fear. I finally picked up my riot shotgun and chambered a round of buckshot. My dog at this time was staring towards the north window of the spare bedroom and was still stiff, but not growling quite as bad. I got up enough nerve to look out the bathroom window, but saw nothing. My yard was surrounded by a three foot high hog wire fence with two strands of barbed wire on top and locked steel gates. So whatever it was stepped over the fence to get into and out of my yard. The gates made a lot of noise if you tried to climb or open them, so it did not come or go through the gates. In the following weeks, while I was walking through the woods near the river, in two different locations, I found several deer that had been killed. At the time, I thought poachers had done it, but they were all complete except for having their abdomens cut torn open and the guts pulled out. None of the meat was gone from any of them, other than what possums or coons had eaten, and most of them had broken legs. Only one was a buck, and it was a yearling spike. One of the deer had been killed right where I found it. There were broken limbs and saplings and hair all around it. There were tufts of deer hair hung in the bark of two larger trees next to the carcass. Some of the tufts were over 10 feet off the ground. Both of the deer's back legs were broken and twisted. Even then, I thought that it looked like something had grabbed that deer by the back legs and beaten it to death against the tree. I didn't tell anybody about any of this. My dad and other folks had told me that people had been hearing and seeing strange things along that part of the river for decades. But I had a neighbor that had told about seeing a Bigfoot on his property just a few years earlier, and everybody laughed at him. In the early fall of 1980, my wife was bringing in the wash one night, about 7 p.m. I had fed the horses some oats about 30 minutes earlier, and I was now in the kitchen, and suddenly I heard a scream outside. I ran out and my wife was running in, scared nearly to death. Something was right outside the gate between the storage shed and the tack room, screaming just like before. The horses went running out there, wide open, the fence and gate there is quite high because there is a corral there also. I could hear it moving around but only get a glimpse of it occasionally. It was much taller than the six foot fence there and it appeared to be black with maybe a little silver or gray mixed in. There's a street light in our yard on that side of the house and when it moved under through a patch of light, I could see the light glint off its fur. It was tall enough that it hit or shoved aside some tree limbs that I have to jump to be able to touch. It screamed several more times, and I could tell that it was becoming more and more agitated. Between screams, I could hear it making a very eerie, strange noise with an intermittent clicking sound that sounded like it was growling as it chewed or moved its mouth. I ran back to the house and locked all my doors. We moved shortly after that, and I spent hardly any time on the farm until we moved back to the area in 1997. My son, daughter, and I, and a couple of two friends were coon hunting on the back of the farm near the river last year, which would have been November 1999. And the dogs were down on the east side of the ridge, and we were waiting up on the top of the ridge for them to tree. We started to hear the same screams as before, 600 yards to the west of us, in one of the areas where I had found a dead deer before. The screams lasted maybe 30 seconds to a minute, 
and then came to a stop. We had tried to get the dogs to go in that direction earlier, and they wouldn't, and we tried again, but they kept circling back around and going to the truck, and these are championship dogs. I didn't get to go back in the woods there until April of this year, which is 2000. I found fresh deer bones in the area where I had found several dead deer 20 years before. Well, me and my cousin were deep in the woods, deer hunting, close to our little campsite, when we heard some very loud popping sounds, maybe 35 yards away. We froze, tried to figure out the sound, but couldn't. We started walking, it was getting late, almost dark, when we started to smell something. It smelt awful, deader than dead. My cousin hears something walking heavy. We turn around to look down the logging road and sees this thing step out of the tree line. It was a good 40 to 45 yards away and had dark brown hair, walked on two legs and was nearly nine to 10 feet tall. The thing just stood there. Out of being so scared, we couldn't move either. I couldn't have shot it if I wanted to but we stared at each other for about three or four minutes when it took a step into the woods. We ran. First time ever seeing anything like that. I told some people, but they laughed and asked me how much I had been drinking. But I don't drink, so I saw the sight and decided to get this off my chest. I've been holding on to this for years, and I haven't been deer hunting that far into the woods since then. This was around Highway 72, off of Baker Lane. I was deer hunting in Freedom Hills management area around Coon Dog Cemetery. I entered the woods before daylight and walked down the access road next to a pine forest. I came to the back of some pines where they had turned into heavy hardwoods. I sat down at the bottom of a tree and waited for daylight. During my way up, behind me on top of the ridge, I hear a series of grunting and heavy movement through the woods, walking down the ridge behind and down the ridge it went. Once daylight came, I walked up to where I first heard the grunting and movement. As I got to the area, I found bedding and hair. The hair I found I kept as a sample, and it wasn't wild hog or bear, nor mountain lion. This whole incident scared me and made me very uneasy. Later that night we heard wood knocks and had a tree pushed down. At approximately 1.30 in the morning, on a night in February 2000, the witness and a friend were planning to visit a girl who lived close to the sighting location. They were riding together on a motorcycle and knew they would not be able to ride up to the girl's house without altering her mother of their presence. They decided to hide the bike on the side of a dirt road and walk to the house from there. Very shortly thereafter, they began to hear what the witness described as a very heavy walking, stomping noise. The witness described these sounds as similar to one, an extremely large person walking, or two, like a horse galloping, but only on two legs, coming from a swampy area which was only northeast of their location. They squatted in the bushes and listened for a couple of moments, at which time they determined the noise was getting closer to them and increasing in pace. At this time, they decided to make a break for the motorcycle and vacate the area. The friend of the witness was in the lead and caused a branch to swing back, hitting the witness in the head, knocking him down and damn near knocking him out. He got back up and began running after his friend, all the while hearing the sounds of stomping and crashing of underbrush, getting closer and closer to them. When he reached the spot where the motorcycle had been stashed, his friend was already pushing it out towards the road. He commented that, at this time, he could also hear heavy breathing which seemed to coincide with each footfall. Once they had the bike on the road, they both jumped on and his friend managed to kick start it and take off. The witness stated that he looked back just in time to see a very large creature leap from the edge of the woods out onto the road. I later measured this distance and it was around 12 feet to 15 foot. He said it hit the road on all fours and then stood fully erect. He did comment that when the creature landed on the road, it let out an audible grunt he could hear even above the noise of the motorcycle. He said the moon was full or near full 
and it was already in the western sky, causing the creature to stand in its own shadow. Since the creature was silhouetted, he was unable to make out any such details like facial features. However, he did emphasize to me that what he saw was not a bear, as he's seen bears before and they were much more narrow than what he saw. He also emphasized this by hunching his arms forward and dropping his shoulders to indicate how a bear would stand, and then standing fully erect with his arms out from his sides in the stance that he said he observed the creature to be in. He said this creature was very wide and had fluffy-like hair, which covered it entirely. He was unable to see any fingers on the hands, although he did state from what he could tell, the hands appeared to be clenched and that the arms were no longer than a human's. He also said that from what he could see, the creature appeared to be a dark brown or black color. When asked about the height of the animal, he said it was at least six to seven feet tall. After thinking for a moment, he stated that his father is 6'4", and that this thing was bigger than his dad, making it closer to 7 feet in height total. This took place in the summer of 2004, around July, in the Bristol Bay County. I am a commercial fisherman in Alaska and have been doing so since 1970. I'm an avid outdoorsman, hunter, and someone who just loves to get out there. Every year after fishing, I try to take a trip upriver with a friend or two to wind down and enjoy ourselves before we go home. This year, while I was on this trip into Alaska's interior, our main mission was to take pictures of bears and the surrounding wildlife to promote a new bear viewing and sports fishing business. While on our five-day trip, we spotted more than 40 bears. I took hundreds of pictures of these bears and their tracks, one of which was so big it put chills up my spine and gave me and my companions a very uneasy sense of insecurity. What set this track apart from the others was its enormous size and human-like shape. In one of the pictures that I took of this track, I placed my foot next to it on the ground. Keep in mind I'm wearing a size 13 boot. Whatever made this track was so heavy, heavier than the biggest bear, that it pushed the gravel so far into the earth that it made us truly speculate what we were looking at. Other pictures that we took of the bear tracks were nowhere close to that indentation that this track had left. One of the most intriguing things about this track, where there were no visible claw marks, is with all the other bear tracks. Both of us felt extremely uneasy of our surroundings and had the feeling that we were being watched. For the rest of the day, we didn't have much to talk about, and that night felt uncomfortable at camp. We never heard or smelled anything out of the ordinary. To this day, I am not really sure what we saw, and I'm not making any claims other than the words I have put forth. I've only heard of one other story, from an old native man that lived by himself, a true hermit. He spoke of a tall creature that walked on two legs, and watched him for 30 minutes from across the river, which his cabin overlooked approximately 200 feet away. When first sighted, he was motionless, staring straight at him. Then this creature, which he named Hairy Man, turned and briskly walked away. My hiking partner and I arrived to the Kennecott area. We were trying to make it to the campsites near the glacier, but it started to get too dark, even for us. So we decided to camp at the first available site. We found a small spot right off the trail so we made camp and hung our supplies in a tree down the trail. Started a fire and were just finishing a small meal when I walked to the trail to smoke. I was standing on a trail a few minutes when I noticed what I thought was a man on the bike coming down the trail. I let my partner know, but when I looked back it was still in the same spot. I started looking more closely to see a face or the bike or something. It was then I realized it was not a person. It was a large dark form, legs spread apart. This is what led me to think it was a person on a bike. The arms were curled at its side like someone with hands on handlebars. Too big for a bear, and the legs were too far apart. 
I called my partner, but when turned back to look at it again, it moved very quickly into the woods on two legs. The next day we looked but found no evidence of anything on the trail. I've told this story to a few people, but they all think I'm crazy. I hope this helps. I know what I saw. I guess I'm just hoping somebody believes me. My hunting buddy and I were sitting on a ridge, watching for caribou. About a thousand yards away, and a large clearing was in view. While we were glassing the clearing for a caribou to come out of the brush, we watched a large gray animal walking on hind legs walk between two large spruce trees on opposite sides of the clearing. We were both longtime Alaskans, avid hunters, and have logged many, many hunts in North America. I have hunted all of the North America's deer, elk, black, and grizzly bear. I have never seen an animal like what we saw that day. We watched it for over half an hour move from one tree across the clearing to the other tree. Eventually, caribou moved into the area and we lost sight of the animal when it moved off into heavy, thick brush. We had never heard of a Bigfoot in Alaska. But we did tell the bush pilot that picked us up from our hunt that we had seen something strange. He told us we had probably seen the hairy man, a well-known animal of the region by the native people. Me and a couple of friends had been bored one December when I decided we should take a walk through the woods behind my house. I didn't think much of it, as me and my friend have done it many times before. There were four of us, and we set out about 11 o'clock at night. It was rather dark, but there was light from the moon. The weather was rather cold, as we did this in the winter. The area we walked on was game trails, trails that moose normally walk on, as well as trails used for mushers, runners, cross-country skiers, and that sort. We had walked about two miles from my house to another entrance where most people enter. On the way, we had talked about unexplainable events or things such as Bigfoot or UFOs. When we reached the bridge where most people come in, one friend had smoked a cigarette. We then saw a light and decided to go on. On the way back, we heard a wild dog barking wildly and decided to pick up the speed. It eventually became a sprint where after we walked. When we walked, we continued talking about it. It was then I realized something had been following us, as well as testing us or even harassing us. It was much earlier, I just didn't think about it. I thought it was my friend Warren who is sometimes clumsy. I thought it was him who had made noises such as slipping, but it was really something throwing something at us. I had realized this was about halfway back. I asked if Warren kept slipping when he told me it wasn't, and he thought I could have been pulling a prank on him. We stopped for a minute to listen when I told the others something strange was going on. We stopped and shone a flashlight around, hearing noises such as steps and branches moving and breaking. The leader had thought I had been playing a joke when I told him seriously I wasn't. He decided to walk behind with me when something threw snowballs and nearly hit us on many occasions. It was then he realized that this was no joke, and we picked up a light jog for most of the way. When we were almost out of the woods, we heard dogs again, maybe 20 feet away, the branches breaking and again something throwing stuff at us. By the time we left, it was about 3 to 3.30 in the morning. I did not go directly to my house because I didn't know if it was still following us. I knew this was not a prank because the snow is more than 5 feet deep in the woods and someone would have had an extremely hard time to play a prank like that. This was in February of 2004, up near Powerline Clearings, east of Potter Marsh, out of Anchorage. I and two of my friends were bored one night, so we decided to do a little snow machining. Thought it was illegal to snow machine in Anchorage, and there were some good trails to ride on a little north of my house. We took off probably at around 11 p.m., rode up and around a quarter mile, and cut off on the trails. It had snowed about 10 inches a few days before, so there was fresh snow, with no tracks. 
I was leading the way for about a half an hour, and then we stopped and talked for a little bit. We took off again and kept cruising on some sort of game trail that led to an opening in the woods. I rode off into the openings with my friends, following about 50 yards behind me. I came over this little mound and saw strange tracks leading to this spot in the snow where it looked like something had pushed aside some snow and laid down. I figured it was just a moose or something, but I followed the tracks over the next small hill and as I came down the far side, my headlight pointed right at the back of a Bigfoot. It was only about 10 to 12 feet in front of me. It was running in the opposite direction. I slammed on the brakes because I was scared out of my mind. It continued to run away, jumped over a dead log covered in snow, and disappeared into a group of trees into the darkness. I was so surprised and scared, I quickly turned around and rode back towards my friends. I met them back by the first mound and said, we need to get out of here, and rode back towards my house. When I told them about it back near my house, they laughed and told me it was probably a bear or somebody in the woods. But I was 100% positive that this was not a bear or anything else. The way it was running through the deep snow made me sure that it wasn't anything human. For a long time, I was made fun of, and everyone told me I was crazy, so I don't like talking about it. It was the month of July, 2009, in Fairbanks, Alaska. I was heading south on Auburn Drive towards Farmer's Loop, which was about a mile away. It was a wooded area, frequented by homes, and in general, would be considered a populated area. Houses are on average about 100 to 200 feet apart, with only the general area around the close to the homes cleared out. Most of the area by far is wooded. It was the section of road where it passes by Pearl Creek Elementary School. The school can be seen through the woods. Some of the woods in the area are quite thick and in some places can't be seen into more than about 10 or 15 feet. But in this area, it had apparently been cleaned out quite a bit and sight lines into the sections of the siding were very open. The school and vegetable garden could be seen off to the right from the road I was on. It was about 6 p.m. and I was heading home after a day of working on a deck that I was building. The weather was clear with the sun high in the sky. As I was driving, I happened to notice a man standing by the right side of the road, about a hundred yards ahead. It was more of an unconscious recognition. There's nothing unusual about a man standing on the side of the road in this area. As I got within about 50 yards, I looked closer. That's no man. I said to myself. Shortly after that, one or two seconds, he bolts into the woods toward the school. He did it like a wild animal would do, if spooked. I didn't slow down until I got to the place where I saw him go to the woods, which is where I stopped. I could see him running away from the road, and when he was into the woods about 30 or so yards, he turned left and was now running parallel to the road in the same direction I was heading. I got a good look at him but not his face. I could have probably seen his face had I not been so mesmerized and had the presence of mind to look at it. I was busy noticing other things. His fur or hair looked to be about three to four inches all over the main part of his body. It was a reddish rusty color. I was mildly struck by how red it was, but it definitely had some rustiness to it. He was about six feet tall and looked to weigh around 200 pounds. He ran with a strange, hoppy kind of run. It wasn't a limp. With one foot he pushed off with was more than a normal running move. But the other foot he pushed off with propelled him upward, about a foot or less, and forward. I watched him until he disappeared into the woods. There was a road about a hundred yards ahead, and I took off to get it so I could turn right, and in twenty yards turn right again to the road that led to the school parking lot. The wooded area he was in was sort of a peninsula, and he seemingly had to be in there somewhere. The woods I was looking into from that angle were quite thick, and I didn't see him, and haven't seen him since. A little farther up on the right was the school garden that had people in it, around 7 to 10, which I'm now sorry I didn't stop to go and talk to them about it. The next day, I was driving in to work on the deck. I naturally slowed down in the area, and I saw him 
stopped actually, and was surveying the area when a couple walking their dogs were approaching. I flagged them down and told the story of what happened the evening before, and they told me that about a week ago, they were there with their dogs and they were on their way to the other side of the school property by the soccer field, and three kids came running over to them saying, did you see Sasquatch? They also said that what appeared to be as a dad was with them who didn't seem excited about it. My conclusion of whether it was real or not is summed up for me saying, it was either real or there was a man in a very, very convincing costume. I reported it to the Fish and Game office in Fairbanks a couple of days later. The person who was taking the report was sort of rolling his eyes through the whole thing as he seemed to be writing it down on a piece of scrap paper. I even had to ask him to take my phone number just in case. I personally did not see it, but a non-commissioned officer I work with, along with his wife, child, and hunting buddy were on their way home when, according to them, a large, hairy, about seven foot tall ape looking thing crossed the road in front of them. From what I could gather, none of them are familiar with Bigfoot information. Anyway, they say it crossed the road, which is about 35 feet in width, in four to five steps it seemed and disappeared into the brush on the other side, which leads to a river called the Chenna. Both of the guys have been hunting since childhood and are sure they know a bear when they see one. The thing crossed the road on its hind legs and as we all agreed, yeah, a bear can raise up on its hind legs and even take a few clumsy steps, but cross a 35 foot road, no way. They say they even came back later and looked for tracks. He wasn't too sure, but he says he found some tracks that didn't look like any tracks he was familiar with. They were pointed inwards as a person who is what I call pigeon-toed. They heard or saw nothing else, but were a bit shook and headed home. The entire story seemed incredible to me because the incident took place on a military installation. I really don't want to get the guys involved because they fear ridicule. This happened in late August of 97 in a side valley of Goldstream Valley, a relatively populated area just north of Fairbanks. Although it's quite close to the Fairbanks area and there are many houses and roads in the main part of Goldstream, the side valleys are still as wild as they were a thousand years ago. I was hunting rough grouse in one of these side valleys, I prefer not to say which one. I was on a south-facing aspen-covered hillside and had hunted all afternoon and evening, intending to spend the night out on the hill and hunt my way back in the morning. As I was making camp, a black bear almost walked right into me. I heard him coming from a ways off and scared him away before he got closer. Later on, it will become apparent why I mention this. So I was sleeping out in the open, no tent, under a spruce tree. Sometime in the middle of the night, I was awakened by something prowling around my camp, maybe 30 feet or so away from me, walking in a circle. I mentioned the bear before, and this was not a bear I heard in the night. My father is a hunting guide, and I literally grew up hunting bears. I know what a bear sounds like when it's walking. Whatever this thing was, it was walking on two legs, with a bit of a shuffling sound between each step like it was dragging its feet just a bit. The leaves on the forest floor were dried like potato chips, and it was breaking a lot of branches. I could hear it and follow its movements quite distinctly. I have to say that I've spent a lot of time here in the Alaskan bush, and have never before or since been truly afraid of anything I've encountered. But I don't mind saying on that particular night, I was literally shaking with fear. It for whatever it was, circled my camp for what seemed like hours, but it was probably only five or so minutes. Finally, remembering something I once read about Indians' beliefs regarding woodsmen, I started talking to it, albeit in a shaky voice, saying I wanted no trouble that night. The thing stopped dead in its tracks, and then a few moments later, I heard it trotting downhill, away from me. Talking to such a creature may sound kind of cornball, but all I know is that it worked. I've kicked myself for this many times since, but the next morning, 
I didn't bother to look for any tracks, hair, evidence, etc. I just packed up and resumed my hunting. I had no further trouble with the woodsman. As a final couple of notes, I do recall hearing kind of a low muttering sound as it was prowling around. Also, having since done some reading on Bigfoot sightings, I've noticed that a lot of people reported the animal having a strong, foul odor. However, I did not smell any particular odor, foul or otherwise. Most of the native peoples of Alaska seem to have stories about the woodsman or the bushman or even the hairy man. Other than this, I've never heard of anyone I know having an actual encounter with a woodsman in Alaska. I was part of a group of about a dozen army personnel training in the area. It was over summer on a warm, clear day, and this was around the Black Rapids Glacier, Alaska Richardson Highway south of Delta Junction. We were about tree line and had been camped there for several days. I was looking across the nearest valley when I spotted movement. It was on the base of a steep mountainside in bare, rocky terrain, with snow fields descending down the small gullies on the hillside. It was moving up the valley, about a half a mile away. When it crossed the snow, you could plainly see that this was not a bear. It walked upright with long strides and arms swinging and moved fast across the white snow. It was dark in color like a bear. I have seen bears many times since in the same type of terrain, and they do not move like this did. It was too big and too fast to be a human. Bears can and do walk upright, but usually only for short distances when they need to see or smell something and need the height. They don't travel in this manner, and not in this difficult of terrain. I pointed it out to the other guys, and we watched it until you could no longer see it. When it was out of the snow, it was hard to see against the rocks. We wanted to go look at the tracks, but everybody was scared to go down there. We had to sleep there that night and nobody would go outside after dark. The next day, we got out and never went back. 20 years later, I still would not go up there, even with a group and with guns. The only thing I have seen that looked like this is the descriptions of Bigfoot. I was telling a friend about this and he said he found tracks in the sand in Alaska, out by King Salmon. He said they were over two feet long but looked human. He has a lot of outdoor experience here and says they were in no way the tracks of a bear. This was also in a remote area where you don't see other people, only planes. Something that I would not believe unless I saw it just stepped up about 30 feet in front of me, stared at me, and kind of grunted and walked into the woods real quiet. I did have a rifle and a handgun on me because I was out hunting, but for some reason I did not feel threatened. Although I did turn around and head back to my car often, glancing over my shoulder. I did hear some cracking branches on several occasions, and I heard a few low to high tones coming from the direction that the really tall thing, at least six feet, and shaggy dark brown thing went down, and made me want to walk a little faster. That was some of those sounds that were answered from the other side of the road. Other than that though, no further sighting or hearing took place over the year. I should mention that this also occurred back in 1964, and I have not been able to put it out of my mind. It occurred on a small dirt road which was about 35 miles south of Fairbanks. This dirt road was directly off the Richardson Highway. Heading south, you take a left off the highway, and this road led to an old camp near a small pond which was about two miles in. This is just a report from a native that said he saw a hairy person, about six to seven feet tall, all hair, casually walking across the dirt road by Skylac Lake. This specifically was Skylac Lake Road by Skylac Lake Road in Kenai Peninsula, off of the main highway back in the woods. This thing looked at him and stopped on the road and appeared surprised. Then it took off into the woods swiftly. He said it was very agile and quick. He was about 300 yards away from it. There was no snow on the ground yet. He said they looked at each other for a bit, and he loaded his single-shot shotgun, because he didn't know if it was friendly or not. 
He was going to run and tell the authorities, but he didn't say anything, and he didn't think anything or anyone would believe him. He was very serious as he was telling the story. I know the man. He is a very strong Christian. That was probably around late October or early November. This place is near Sterling, Alaska. The location is full of spruce forest. I've been there. It's secluded from the main highway and full of forest and lakes and mountains. This sighting goes back to the fall of 1992. A friend and I were driving back to Fairbanks from Anchorage. I was driving her truck, a 1980 Dodge D50. These trucks sit very low to the ground, and it was late at night, and we were just about to the tourist area of the Denali Park. It wasn't winter yet. Just before a corner, my lights hit something sitting on the yellow line in the middle of the road. The lights to this truck were grossly out of adjustment, so they were pointing right at the thing. It was sitting in the middle of the road with its legs pulled up to its chest and its arms folded over its knees. Its head was between its arms looking toward the ground. It had long, human-like hair. At first, I thought it was an orangutan, but then I thought to myself, what would orangutan be doing in the middle of nowhere in Alaska? I've lived here almost all of my life and there is no animal like this. I thought to myself the only way that could have been an orangutan if there's a circus out here, and I knew that was not a possibility in such a remote area. I drove right next to it, and I was at its level. If I had been going slow, I could have touched it easily. I was freaked out and thought I must be seeing things. Maybe I was tired. My friends saw it too. Although neither one of us said a word until we reached the gas station in the town of Healy, just past Denali. She said, did you see that? And I said, I thought I was seeing things. This spooked us so bad we didn't even say anything to each other about it until we were around other people. We have talked about this and still agree that we saw this thing. We were about to give up on trying to explain it to anyone else because no one believes us. We both have decided not to bring it up because no one believes it anyway. Why I feel this is so unusual is there's no animal native to Alaska that could resemble this thing in any way. We have bears, moose, caribou, porcupine, rabbits, etc. But none of these animals have knees or long reddish colored hair. I don't know how to explain it and I've given up trying because nobody believes it. They just think you're joking. I don't want to be harassed by any nuts, I just want to be able to share my genuine incident in case others have seen what I have. I was going for a drive back in the spring of 1995. I had three kids with me, my daughters and one of their cousins. It was starting to get dark and I decided I wanted to turn around and not go all the way down this sort of yard. So I pulled into a turnaround. I had the car lights on, just in the bushes on the other side of the road though. I noticed some movement. I thought it might have been a deer, so I stopped the car entirely. The first thing I really saw was really bright blue eyes. Then I noticed how far up they were. The thing had to be about 8 to 9 feet tall. The rest of this thing was really dark. It might have been black or dark brown. My daughters saw the feet. They were huge. When I realized it might be a Bigfoot, I freaked out and tore out of there. I've never been down there after dark again. I rarely go there at all. It didn't move after the initial movement we saw. It just stood there looking at us. There are local legends about a wild man in the woods, and recently there have been a rash of sighting. Some of them are pretty close to town. The people who claim to have seen it are pretty believable, and their stories are quite convincing. I and my cousin were walking down Harris River from the Harris River campground. We were walking about 30 to 45 minutes when my cousin thought he saw something standing out in front of us about 100 or so feet away. When he asked me if I could see what it was, I told him I couldn't see because I don't have any contacts on or glasses. So he told me it was just a stump and I was like, 
Okay. Then we went over to where we thought the thing was, and in the sand about an inch deep, there was a footprint like a man's. In the shoe size, it looked like it might have been around the size 15. There were three footprints, and about a minute later, we ran for about 10 minutes and we started walking, and then we got to the road. About a mile away from the picnic area, where we were having a Mother's Day picnic, we started to race each other to the picnic area where our family members were. We told them about it, and we just kept it to ourselves for some odd reason. This incident happened around 11 p.m. at night. My daughter was home alone. She lives with a relative who was out of town. She calls me at 11.22. She was terrified. She said she could hear something walking back and forth by her bedroom window. She also said she looked out the window and when she first heard it and saw something big and black, really big. She described the thing to have been about three to four feet above the bottom of the window. When I went down to look behind the house this morning, I stood by the window. I am 5'4", and my eyes just reached the bottom of the window, so I figure this thing must have been 7 to 8 feet tall. We live in a small village of less than 500 people. There are a lot of bushes and trees in between the houses. Their house is close to the beach, and there is forest surrounding the town. Now I have never known my daughter to be afraid of anything. But last night, when I went to pick her up, she was shaking like a leaf. She was hysterical. It took me almost an hour to calm her down. I questioned her about what happened. She called me about five minutes after she first saw it. She was too scared to move. When I got down there, I would not look behind the house, but she was hiding in my relative's closet. She said it was walking back and forth right behind the house. She described the footsteps as a sound that someone very large walking on two feet, kind of like a stomping. My daughter is very down to earth, not one prone to dramatics. When I first went down there, I didn't really know what was going on, just that my daughter was scared spitless, but I would not look behind the house. When I went up to the house, my hair felt like it was standing on end and I had goosebumps really bad. I was scared and I didn't know why. There are quite a few other stories about sightings close to town. One was less than a mile away, but there have also been other sightings on a nearby road by several people. In fact, there's probably too many for me to tell about. This incident happened with my mother, father, and uncle four-wheeling on the Como Road in Colorado. We had made it past Lake Como and to the end of the Jeep Road where we fished for a while and ate our lunch. When we left the last lake, it was about 1.30 p.m. with my uncle and me in the lead on our four-wheelers. We had gone about a half mile when my uncle and I spotted something that looked like a dead, burned tree stump that was about seven to eight feet tall. We didn't think too much of it until it moved. It stood upright and walked like a man. At first we thought it was a hiker, but it was all the same color, from head to toe. It walked about 15 yards before it walked into the trees. My uncle and I both stopped to make sure we saw the same thing, but we drove down the road about 300 to 400 yards before we decided to go look for it. We walked into the trees about 200 yards and came to a small meadow. My uncle was looking the other way when at the other end of the meadow it ran through. I yelled, there it goes, and we took off after it on foot. This time I got a little bit better chance to look at it. The creature was a light to a medium brown and had shaggy long hair. It stood about seven feet tall. When we reached the end of the meadow, each of us went into an opposite direction. My uncle went the same direction as the Bigfoot, and I went the other way, in case it double-backed on us. But we didn't see the creature after that. We did find a few footprints, but didn't have any plaster to make a mold, so we went back down the mountain. I know what I saw that day, and no one can tell us otherwise.
Two friends and I went camping in the San Juan National Forest on 6104. DC and I were from out of state, but JG was a regular camper there. We went 12 miles up the Forest Service Road and picked a campsite. We saw no one else that day, and it was a dead-end road. JG said it was the first time he'd been there alone. We spent the day hiking around and cooking meat over the campfire. We did not see or hear anything unusual that day, other than a partial horse skeleton. At about midnight, we were winding down when we heard three two-tone howls to the hill, approximately one-fourth a mile to our north. We knew it was not a coyote, but almost sounded like a person trying to imitate a coyote because it had a deeper bass tone. About five minutes later, we heard the same thing again. Then I heard something like a gunshot in the same area, but there was no sonic crack. It was like something hit a tree really hard. Both sounds came from the same place as the first set of howls did. We were all standing around the fire, wondering what it was. JG had a shotgun in hand and we were all starting to get a little edgy. We are all police, former police, former military, so it takes a lot to get any of us edgy. We all have camping experience and none of us have ever experienced anything like this before. About five minutes later, directly to our west was a very loud two-tone howl, approximately 100 yards away. It howled again and it was closer, so it was closing in on us. DC and I drew our pistols and flashlights, and all of us focused on the logging road, that if they would have to cross to get to us. There was a bright full moon, so the open areas were well illuminated. It howled one more two-tone howl before stopping at what we estimated to be 50 yards away in the wood line. It seemed like it covered at least 50 yards, going through the woods while howling three times. Whatever it was, was big and loud. There was a lot more bass to the howls than a dog or coyote or a wolf. Each time it howled, it was a two-tone in a series of three, and it seemed unemotional or even intelligent. About a minute later, another series of three two-toned howls came from the hill to the south, approximately a quarter mile away. It seemed to be answering the one hiding in the tree line in front of us. Then the one in the tree line let out three more of the same howls. Let me stress again, this thing was loud. We were all pretty shaken. We felt that we had aroused at least three big things that were communicating amongst themselves and closing in on us. We were all facing out from a dying fire with weapons and flashlights drawn. We didn't know if we were being studied or they were getting in position for an attack. We decided to leave. After some debate, we decided to pack the trucks while one of us took turns watching with a flashlight and gun. A few moments later, we were packed and headed down the mountain to the main road. We did not see or hear anything while packing or leaving. When we got to the road, we stopped to unload our guns and stow them legally in the trucks. There was one house close to the road and after a while, the dogs started to bark. I joked to JG that they were coming after us. Just then, we heard another set of howls about a mile back the road we had just come down. Whatever it was had followed us, and we left immediately. We were not sure what it was that night, but after talking about the incidents quite a bit, we think we had a Bigfoot encounter. It was a remote, wooded mountain location with a large lake over the hill. There were at least three intelligent beings communicating that sounded loud and very large. We had been leaving our scent all around and had been cooking meat all day. No person would be crazy enough to risk getting shot playing a prank on us. The howls were very eerie to say the least. Like I said, they were all like the first two tones of a wolf howl, but much more base. There was no trailing off like a dog, coyote, or wolf howl would do. Just two tones. Each two-tone howl was in a series of three howls that took approximately six seconds per series. The only thing missing from the encounter was the lack of the famous Bigfoot stench. 
There was no wind, so maybe the thing in the tree line was far enough away for it not to reach us. We are not out to hoax anyone. We hope none of our colleagues find out, so our day-to-day -day judgment is not questioned or even ridiculed. It was Friday, January 25th, 2001. At first, I was not even going to go down to the area where I and a friend saw a Bigfoot. I was going to finish watching the Bogosa basketball team play and go home, but a boxing match was on the same night, and my best friends, not the friend that saw it with me, brother-in-law was going to buy it on pay-per-view, and his brother-in-law lives in the area of Cromo and Edith in Colorado. There are always some crazy sightings of UFOs and Bigfoots, but I really didn't believe in these types of things until I saw one for myself. We watched the boxing match, and after it was over, we started to head back to Bogosa Springs on Chroma Road, and we were almost to Highway 84, when about 20 yards in front of us, this thing or Bigfoot crossed and went quickly, almost as if we were seeing things. I didn't know what to think, so I asked Sammy if he saw it, and he said, what was that? We didn't know what to think. We weren't sure. We got up to where it crossed, and I opened my door to look down on the road and saw a footprint, and Sammy opened his door and saw a track too. We both freaked out, and I drove as fast as I could. We didn't tell that many people, only the ones that would believe us. On December 20th, 2000, my wife and daughter were walking along a road when they spotted two large footprints in the snow, about five feet off the road, a quarter mile away from our cabin. Due to the size of the prints, at first they thought it was a bear, but as they got closer, they saw it was this huge footprint and it was very similar to a man's without shoes on. They came home insisting I come and look at this thing. I examined the print by placing my foot next to it. My shoe size is 10 and a half, and this print was 5 inches longer and double the width. I estimated it was 14 inches long with toes and a slight curve in the arch area. It was left a mystery until today's Denver Post arrived with an article on Bigfoot displaying the same footprint we examined on that day in December. I live in Denver, Colorado, and I may have seen a Bigfoot when I was in college in Boulder, Colorado, several years prior. This occurred in November of 1995. I was a freshman college student in Boulder, Colorado, and I used to like hiking in the Chautauqua Park nearby, which is higher than the rest of Boulder and faces the city. One night, I was in Chautauqua Park at about 11 p.m. It was cold and I was standing in my coat, looking down at the city lights. Suddenly, I heard a rustling sound and turned toward it. That's when I saw a large figure that was silhouetted against the city lights. It looked like a very large, hairy, naked person with a powerful build, broad shoulders, and a relatively small, pointed or bullet-shaped head. It spotted me, which made me afraid of being attacked, but instead it began running toward the cover of the trees. Its running gait was unlike that of any person I had seen. It was a kind of hunched-over, loping gait. Nevertheless, the figure moved quickly and disappeared behind a tree. That was all I saw of the figure. I have always considered this a possible Bigfoot sighting. This incident occurred after my husband, myself and our three children and I had moved up to some land purchased on Sugarloaf Mountain, west of Boulder, Colorado. My husband managed a tavern at the time and had purchased the five-acre silver mining claim for a song from at the bar, and on a paper napkin. I'm withholding the name of the song. We built a tiny 12 by 16 cabin and squeezed ourselves in there on the south side of the mountain, about two thirds of the way along the original little mining road. The cabin was on only level land on a heavily treed and rocked parcel. The north side of the cabin snugged right up against the mountain slope with pine trees all around. That side was two plywood sections high which 
would have put it a hair over 16 foot. We had an oversized plywood platform, bunk bed, in the northeast corner of the cabin, which we adults and our baby daughter on the first level, and the two boys on the upper level. We put in a little window up there for them for air, and put in an inside shutter on it so they could close it when it got really cold, which it sometimes did. It reached 40 below the first winter we were there. I think it was during the second autumn there, so it would have been 1971. Our then five and a half year old son claimed he heard the sound of footsteps in the early evening after hearing a really strange sound. Definitely an animal, but he had no words at the time to even describe it or the age. He said it sounded like a call of some sort and bigger than an owl. Some kind of hooting, I can guess. Then he heard some noises close by, rustlings or something. When he looked up through the open shutter window, he said he looked right into the face of a monster. All I know for sure is that I'll certainly never forget his terrified screams. When he calmed down, he described it as dark and very hairy, and a funny face and glowing eyes. It turned and ran away as soon as he started screaming. His brother, two years older, slept through the incident until his brother's shrieks woke us all up. With the ground sharply slanted up, we figured something would have had to have been just about seven to eight feet tall to peer into that upper window. Not being trained trackers, we found no evidence the next day. But our son, who is now almost 35, swears to this day that it was Bigfoot that he saw, and I have always believed him since there was no way in the world that at his age, he could have made that a precise and auditory visual image of his terror. He came over and visited us this morning, told him about the article in the post, and he reiterated his story. He says the image has never left him, and probably never will. I grew up in Boulder County. My parents quit farming in Northeast and moved to Longmont in 1960. During the summer, we would go up to Big Thompson Canyon or the St. Vrain to camp and picnic. In the summer of 1964, we were picnicking along the St. Vrain stream. We had started a campfire. You could do that then. And while I was looking for wood, I felt like I was being stared at. I looked up and at the top of a sheer rock wall, about 30 feet up, I saw him. I could see him like yesterday. He was looking at me, and as soon as I saw him, he turned and left. He was very large, probably eight feet tall and had long graying hair. His face was darker and did almost look human. No one believed me, of course, but I can still see his eyes looking at me before he turned, so I have always believed in their existence. I was driving south down from the mountain on my regular route I had my high beams on because it's dark in that area. It's very rural when all of a sudden a large upright dark figure stepped out into the road. I stopped and watched it cross the road in three steps. This thing was so tall that it stood at least a foot and a half above the rack on the roof of my Jeep Grand Cherokee. The legs were long and it bent at the knee like a human. All I seen was the side profile of it. It was very tall, and from what I could see, the head was large and long. The shoulder span was very wide, too. The side profile of the face was flat. It very quickly, in three steps, crossed the road. It's a wide two-lane road. After it crossed, I drove forward a little and tried to see where it went, but I couldn't see it anymore. This thing was frightening. I have been looking for it every time I'm on my route, but had not seen it again. On my other route, which is on a county road, 306, about a 10 minute drive from this incident, two days later, there was a very strange, strong smell in the area, around 3 a.m. The smell was a very strong, sweet, burning rubber smell. I can't describe it. I never smelled anything like it before. I smelt this for two days straight in this area, and then it was gone. This incident occurred in Chaffee County, Colorado, in an area known as Middle Fork. 
about 14 to 17 miles west of Salida, off of Highway 50. My friend had an elk tag for that area, but I did not draw, so I was just along for the ride. My friend took a stroll up a very high ridge as I stayed in the bottom, walking along the creek that split the saddle. As I made my way down the creek, I noticed a strange single track in a patch of snow. The track was old as the snow was melting away its clarity, but it strongly resembled that of a human print. It was extremely large, 16 inches long, 7 inches wide. I must have studied the track for an hour, trying to make it out, but it was so very unclear. I did not see another track in the immediate area, but I decided to show it to my friend anyway, even though I started believing that it was just an act of nature. My friend was intrigued by the track, as he found more characteristics in the print than I did. He pointed out the toes, which were very hard to see, but when you looked hard, they were there. They seemed to go straight across the top of the foot, in a straight line, but only three were visible. We then chatted about the track for a while, and making excuses for what else it could be. We then decided to head back down. We walked down the creek a little farther when we saw something we could not believe. About 100 yards from the original track were about six or seven additional tracks in snow and mud. These tracks were in much better condition. They had the same dimensions of the first track and appeared to be just as old. They were in a shaded area, so they were somewhat preserved. Like the first track, they only showed three toes, but one track showed four, and one showed five. The only explanation I had for the tracks being so far apart was whatever made the tracks must have used the rocks along the creek to walk on. I was camping with my family at the headwaters of Clear Creek Reservoir near Granite, Colorado. I was very young at the time. I was with eight of my cousins and we decided to climb the hill at the north end of the reservoir to get a better view of the area. There were nine of us ranging in age from nine to 14 years old. When we reached the top of the hill, we started rolling rocks down the hill. It was then that we noticed right across the ravine from where we stood a tremendous amount of crashing through the aspens. At first, we thought it was a grizzly bear since it stood on its hind legs watching us from a distance of about 300 feet. Its hair was golden brown in color and very long. It was very tall. I'd say at least eight feet. It just stood there on two legs looking straight at us. I could not see its face. The sun was at its back and its face was in silhouette but I could tell that the face was very dark. The head and body were large and were not built like a bear. We stood and watched this animal and it watched us for several minutes. It stood on two legs and at all times it seemed to rock back and forth. At the time I assumed that this was because it wanted to get our scent or maybe get a better view. We then decided to run for it. We came down the hill at breakneck speed and were scolded by our parents who thought we could have broken a leg running so fast down the hill. My parents claimed it was a bear, but I've been hunting and fishing these mountains for 30 years. I have never seen a grizzly bear in this part of the state. I have seen grizzly bears before, and their fur is brown. The color of the fur on this animal was unlike anything I have ever seen. Again, it was very long and golden in color. To this day, me and my cousins swear we saw Bigfoot. A friend and I and my dog were hiking in the Loveland Pass of Colorado. We parked on Highway 6 where it crosses the Continental Divide and hiked south along the divide for about five miles. We meandered down into one of the valleys carved into the divide on the eastern side. We were looking for pioneer artifacts from the many who passed through this area on the trek to California. We had descended below the tree line where the valley peters out into a boggy meadow. This meadow runs down to a stream to the immediate east. The stream is large at this point, and I think this is the same stream that can be seen from Interstate 70 at the Eisenhower Tunnel several miles north at the Loveland Ski Resort. 
Dense brush and tree cover run along the opposite bank. We began to hear what we thought were noises from a large animal across the stream. We tried approaching the source of the noise, but as we moved closer, the sound moved away downstream along the opposite bank. I started catching glimpses of a large, hairy brown and black animal and thought we were following a bear. My friend had the same idea and our pace slowed to a halt. The animal then moved a little closer to us and appeared to watch us for several seconds. Its height made it look like a bear reared up on its hind legs. It then turned and moved off downstream through the brush in a long, loping, two-legged gait that would have been impossible for a bear. We did not care to follow. Adding to my belief that what we saw was not a bear or other wild animal is the fact that my dog did not bark or show any of the aggressive excitement he usually displays upon encountering a wild animal. He actually drove an adult black bear, which was pillaging garbage cans, out of a campground several years ago. During our encounter in Loveland, he only showed the polite interest he shows in people in the woods. In early June of this year, I was riding my four-wheeler above Jasper, Colorado, at about 7 in the morning. I had stopped to rest at the logging block when I heard a loud howling noise. There was no wind that day and I could not focus in on the source. I had seen a lot of sheep on Cornwall Mountain, all the way up, so I figured it was a dog or the sheep herder. When I had finished my water, I was loading everything back on the bike, when I heard the same sound again, only this time it was much louder. I zeroed in on it and my heart stopped. Slightly below my logging road and to my right, I observed a very large, dirty black man-like creature with its hands around an aspen tree. It was leaning a little to the right, staring at me. I stood very still and never took my eyes off of it. After about seven or eight minutes, it turned and simply walked off down the hill. I will add that I am a 30-year archery hunter and have successfully tagged bears in the same unit. This was no bear. It was large and very shaggy looking. Let me begin this with a brief bit of information about the area. The South San Juan Wilderness in the San Juan Mountains of southwestern Colorado is considered to be Colorado's wildest corner. It was in the backcountry of this wilderness in the fall of either 1977 or 1979, I forget which, that a so grizzly bear was startled and attacked a bow hunter. He was mauled but managed to kill the bear with an arrow he repeatedly drove into the bear's chest. It was thought that the grizzly had long been extirpated from all of Colorado. If there are grizzlies still in Colorado, this is where they are thought to be. I have been hiking, backpacking, camping, and fly fishing in this area for about six years now, making about two to three trips per spring, summer, fall. And one of those trips usually includes a backpack into the backcountry. I am very familiar with the sounds and the various animals that make in this forest and mountains of the west and of this specific area. On this last trip, I managed to sneak away for a three-day weekend in mid-June with the new lab. I heard that salmon fly hatch had started and wanted to try and get a piece of the action, fly fishing for big, aggressive trout. I figured I would save myself a few dollars by not camping in the developed Forest Service campsites and enjoy some solitude at the same time. So I camped in large series of meadows known as the Trail Creek Primitive Camping Area. No water, no services, just camp where you will. I was about 15 miles from the tiny community of Platoro at the upper end of the Conejes Valley and maybe 10 to 15 miles from the next nearest community of assorted vacation houses known as the Rocky Mountain Estates back down the valley. I did not realize it at the time, but this was a remote area, even though the dirt road that ran up and down the valley was only about a half a mile across the meadows from my camping spot. Behind me, by about 50 yards, was the edge of a 150-foot moderate canyon of the upper section of the Pinnacles, run of the river. On the other side of the canyon, which is steep but easily crossed by humans, 
is a huge expanse of mountainside of aspen groves, spruce and fir trees, and mountain meadows. This is the beginning edge of the South San Juan wilderness area. The second evening I had cooked dinner and taken the lab out for the last evening walk around the meadows. It had been a good day of fishing and we were both tired. We went to bed in the tent just at dark. It was a night of an almost full moon and we both fell asleep quickly. A bit later, I awoke and thought I had heard something outside the tent, probably a deer. But because I was curious, I sat awake for a bit and listened. After about 10 minutes from out of nowhere, I heard this unreal, loud, clear, resonant scream, screech, howl, roar type sound from not too far away. It sounded maybe 400 yards away and like it might have been just across the canyon on the mountainside. It was like no sound I have ever heard in my life. It was fairly high-pitched and did not have the rough, gravelly sound that cats have when they roar and call. It was clear, crisp, loud, and lasted for six seconds. It seemed to be two parts screaming howl and one part roar, as it had that deep quality, but it was still high-pitched. I sat there for a minute, stunned, and then realized what it must be. I have read accounts on several websites before of the sounds these creatures supposedly make, and this was what my mind came to, so I guess chance does favor that prepared my mind. It was not that far away. The sound seemed to be coming directly toward me, like it might have been screaming at or towards me or this meadow area where people sometimes camp. It felt territorial, aggressive, even a little threatening. Even though I had a 357 loaded, with hot hollow points and a strong flashlight. The prospect of encountering some big hairy man thing outside my tent in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere and alone was a little more than I wanted to deal with. I got the dog in the truck and got the hell out of there with a 357 in my lap. After a few minutes on the way back down the valley toward an area where I could sleep in peace, I sort of had delayed reactions. I became unnerved and thought if I actually see one of these things in the headlights or on the side of the road next to my truck as I passed it, I might really lose it. I was that rattled. I have lived and backpacked extensively in Montana and in the Canadian Rockies and dealt with the reality of grizzly bears with no real problem, but this noise and the creature that most likely made it really freaked me out. After sleeping in the car in the nearest little town of Antonio, I could not find any lodging at 11.30 at night. I went back a little after daybreak to look around and to get ready for another day of fishing. I ate a cautious breakfast and kept looking around, worried I might actually see one of these things. But in the daylight, I was not quite as unnerved. I did not find any tracks in the greater area in which I was camping. It was just mostly grass, although I did walk around and search for a bit. When I got home, I went online and listened to recordings of mountain lions and bobcats. Although I know these sounds and have actually seen a mountain lion up close in the wild, the sound was definitely not one of these. But when I went to this website and listened to some of the recordings, I realized it had to be one of these creatures. The sound was a bit higher in pitch than some of the other recordings, but very similar to most other respects. Now, I am paranoid and worried that I might not be doing any more backpacking in this beautiful and remote area for fear of running into one of these spooky creatures, especially at night. In the spring of 1997, I had to make a trip to Jonesboro, Arkansas. Since I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas, the best way was across Highway 463, across the top of the state. I think that's the highway number. It's the only time I've ever been on that road. Anyway, I finished my business and was returning home that evening. It was around 9 p.m. when I passed through a small town named Salem. With the town behind me, I was once again the only car on the highway. My headlights were bright. The windows were up because I had the heater on and the radio was playing softly. 
There was a clearance of maybe 20 feet between the edge of the road and the woods when I noticed what I thought was a tree standing right beside the road. As I got closer, the tree turned and took just a few steps and was at the woods. It was huge and had long matted hair. Actually, it looked quite nasty. It never looked directly at me. It was slipping into the woods as I passed to the point of it going out of my headlights beam. I stomped on the gas with everything I had and didn't slow down until I was safely in the lights of the next town. As I drove wildly down the highway at 90 miles an hour, that's the fastest the car I was driving would go, I kept looking in the rearview mirror to make sure it wasn't chasing me. I know that sounds nutty, but at the time it seemed like a really good idea. I was perfectly sober at the time. Maybe that should be a lesson to me. I never gave much thought about Bigfoot until that night. Now I know they exist. I saw one with my own eyes. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Late March or early April 2009, approximately 18-15 hours, I was southbound on GA-75 between Helen and Cleveland, about 0.2 miles north of Duncan Bridge, which is Highway 384. As I rounded a bend, I saw something getting ready to cross the road from east to west. As I slowed, my first thought was that somebody was dressed in a costume, but I dismissed that idea because every pickup around here had a shotgun in the back window, and a good percentage, like myself, had a gun in the car. When he heard me, he stopped on the shoulder. He did not look at me for a few seconds, but then slowly, he turned toward me, looked, then continued to turn 180 degrees and walk into the woods. I was unable to pull off the shoulder and park because of hay bales and plastic used to stop erosion. Traffic was backing up behind me, so I drove to Duncan Bridge, then left on a private road, with the hope of seeing him again. No luck. What I saw, he appeared to be six foot two, six foot four. He was standing erect, but had a slightly hollow chest. His legs and torso seemed normal, as compared to a human, but his arms were longer. His fur was full and sleek. It had a shine to it, a medium light brown. He looked healthy. It was his eyes that I remember the most. He looked at me with an intelligence that you don't see in an animal. The only other time I experienced that was with a dolphin. My husband and I live just outside of Helen. My husband can't sleep very well at night, and as such, he is up at all hours. For about the last three weeks, he has heard strange sounds late at night. He has gotten me up several times to listen, Whatever we are hearing is not anything we have ever heard before. All of the dogs go crazy, and whatever it is seems to move very quickly, attracting the dogs as it goes. It is very loud, and at more of a howl or scream. It does not sound like a bobcat or bear, or anything else we have heard since living in Northeast Georgia. We have lived in this area for nine years, and my husband has hunted all of his life. And it used to sound in the night, just not this one. When he woke me up to hear this, we jokingly said, maybe it's a Bigfoot. I got curious as to whether or not there had been any sightings in our area. I was camped about a mile from the shelter and was enjoying myself when I suddenly felt uneasy and decided to go to an omitted shelter where a man on the trail said other people were camping. As I went about 50 yards from where I was camping, I surprised something that I did not see, but it took off down the side of a cliff and I just assumed it was a bear. When I got to the shelter, just after dark, I set up in the shelter. About 5.30 a.m., I heard a very loud, high-pitched howling sound, twice, that was like nothing I have ever heard or seen on TV. The first howl sounded like it was answered by the second, that was not quite as loud. I sat straight up and thought, what was that? I did not go back to sleep. It did not sound even close to any animal I have ever heard. It was about 11 p.m. and we had just laid down to sleep. We were staying in a cabin that we had rented for the weekend. 
I heard this high-pitched, horrific scream. It was close. It was not some faint, distant sound. It was very clear and very close. My first thought was a woman in distress, and then, about 20 seconds later, I heard it again. I also heard dogs barking above me, higher up on the ridge. This time, I realized it was probably not a human. The sound was forceful, deliberate, high-pitched, reverberating scream. Because I was inside the cabin, it is hard to tell how far away this was. I would guess within 750 feet, perhaps as close as 200 feet. The scream continued for about four or five more times, repeating every 25 seconds. I have military and hunting experience and have never heard such a sound. I cannot think of an animal that can make this type of sound. I will never forget it, that's for sure. I was sitting on my couch, watching TV with my small dogs around me. My male Yorkie saw it when I went out our back door. It was still daylight. I thought it was a man at first, but it was too large, too dark, and fleeting. The dog jumped up and ran to the back door, but I moved slowly over there, being a little frightened. When I looked out the door, it was gone. My first impression of it being a man was because of the general shape but the dark figure wasn't wearing clothes and had to be well over 10 feet tall just to see it through the doorway like I did. I was able to see the upper body from where I was sitting. The porch drops off with the stairway to the patio around the pool. That's where it was walking rapidly next to the house. By the time I got to the door to look out, it was over the fence and gone. My instinct was to check the gate and I saw it was still latched and locked never having been opened. It wasn't a human. It was too large. It wasn't a bear. It was running upright. I can't come up with any other thing that could be that tall and that could do what it did. And having seen what I saw in 1999, I don't take this very lightly. It was June 15th, 1997, Father's Day. My friends and I had been rock climbing at Ravencliff Falls in the Chattahoochee National Forest, just outside of Helen, Georgia. After climbing all day Friday and Saturday morning, a rainstorm made us pull down our rigging and head out of the woods. We drove down to Helen and walked around until about 5 p.m. We filled up the truck and headed back towards Ravencliff to find a campsite for the night. We found a small dirt road that had been barricaded with a large dirt brim. We drove over the berm and drove into the forest. We drove until we had half a tank of gas, which put us several miles back in. Around 11 or 11.30 p.m., we found a small clearing and decided to stop and make camp. Once we exited our truck, we found a shallow hole that was about three to four feet in diameter that appeared to be an old fire pit it had a large log laying on one side of it. We gathered wood for a fire and began to set up camp. Since the weather was nice, we decided to not mess with tents and hammocks. After about 30 minutes of lying down, I heard a noise in the tree line on the left side of our camp. It sounded like an animal moving through the brush. I dismissed it and tried to go back to sleep. I continued to hear the noise for several minutes. I've spent a lot of time in the woods, hiking and camping. The next thing I heard was nothing I had ever heard before. I heard a grunt and then a scream that did not sound like any other animal. It sounded like it came from maybe 50 to 100 yards away. I asked what it was and my friends did not have an answer. We began kidding around, saying that we were out a good way and it could be a Sasquatch. I did not go to sleep for a while after that scream. Finally, I drifted to sleep and slept until daybreak. As we got up to get our gear packed, we noticed prints next to the fire that none of us had ever seen before. They definitely were not human, but were too big for any animal known to be in an indigenous to that area. We quickly loaded up and left the area. It was on Thanksgiving night in 1999. I was driving home from my daughter's apartment in Cleveland, Georgia, when suddenly 
I thought I saw a man crossing the road on Highway 75. I hit my brakes and realized that it was wearing no clothes and was covered in hair like a bear, but it walked upright and hunched more like a man or a huge ape-like thing. It was definitely not a bear. It was large and long-armed. It turned its head and looked over at me, then swiftly jumped down a huge drop and disappeared into the woods. It all happened so fast. I was shocked and went home, not sure of what I believed I had seen at the moment. Before then, I had never been sure if something like that had existed, and I tried to rationalize what I had seen. But now, I am convinced that it was, in fact, neither man, nor bear, nor simple ape. I cannot prove what it actually was, but I can say that it was quite amazing. Either that night or the next morning, I called animal control, saying that I saw a bear, believing that it wouldn't be taken serious if I said what I know that I saw. There were cattle nearby that needed protection. In May of 1993, some of my friends of mine and I decided to go trout fishing above Helen, Georgia. After fishing for a couple of hours, one guy and I decided to go up river to find some new spots. So we started walking up an old roadbed that followed along the river. We eventually got to a spot where there was a goalie across the road. At one time, there must have been a bridge. While me and my friend were standing there, we heard a loud thud behind us. As we turned around, there was a big 10-foot log, about the diameter of a car tire, lying there. Take into account just a second ago, that log was not there. We climbed over the log and started to head back down the road, when all of a sudden, we heard leaves shuffling above us. Both my friend and I had a strange feeling as we looked at each other. At the same time, we both looked up above us, and there was a Bigfoot standing 10 to 15 feet from us. We hauled ass out of there. We finally made it back to where our other friends were and told them what happened. They wanted to go see. The guy that was with me said no and went back to the vehicle. I took the other two guys to show them and on the way there, we saw a footprint in the mud that looked like somebody walking barefoot except it was approximately 18 inches in length. We walked back and saw nothing else. I'm 6'3 and 290 pounds, and this thing dwarfed me big time. It was at least 9 feet tall and about 4 feet across at the shoulders. It had to weigh around 800 pounds. It really looked like a big human covered in long, shaggy black hair. The thing that got me was its reddish brown eyes. It took years for me to go back up there fishing, and when I did, I would not go alone. It's weird because sometimes when you're up there, you feel safe, but other times I feel like something, something is watching you. Since then, I have heard wood knocking, vocalizations, and had rocks thrown at me. I do not hesitate to go up there anymore, but I will not go alone. I have a personal experience that would like to relate. I would hesitate to call it an encounter because it was dark and from an undetermined distance. Somewhere between 30 to 50 yards and it was on an elevated plane to us. Just outside of Helen, off of SR-75, north of the upper Chattahoochee River recreation area. If you go to the top of the mountain, north of the park clearing, that's where my experience was. I had my first experience there in the year of 1990. While a group of five friends and I were walking late at night, we saw something on a bridge and it stood up, clearly visible, but only as a silhouette in the moonlight and jumped a very large distance. It then seemed to stride over the back side of the ridge away from us. It was actually very quiet. It didn't make a sound before we saw it stand and we didn't hear it land or stride away as if it was stalking or observing us. Of course, we were all extremely scared after seeing it initially. Again, it was at night and far away so that we couldn't get a clear description, but we all saw it and were all struck with a panic like fear. I also went back with my dad who was a very harsh skeptic in the summer of 2006. 
We did not see anything, but I had noted a couple of other things at this later date. It was summer. First, there was a very strong odor that seemed to hang in a centralized area the entire weekend. Secondly, the park rangers came by to tell us that the night before, in the same place we were camping, last people left food out, went into town after nightfall, and returned to find the camp completely ransacked. So, we needed to pack our food up, or better yet, keep it in the vehicles back on the road. They said the bears were foraging and getting brave because of the onset of the drought. Again, no sightings but interesting because nobody actually spotted the bear either. And lastly, along the mountain road at a height of about 10 feet off the ground, there was a four inch sapling rung and twisted completely around. My dad once spent three months in the woods living off the land in the late 70s in North Georgia. It's the number one reason he is skeptical, he says. That long in the woods, and he would have seen something if it was out there. But when I noticed the odor and asked him if it was a skunk, he said no, not really. More likely a wet bear that got sprayed by a skunk. But it had a more dank odor than just skunk. And also, when I pointed out the rung tree and asked him what it could have possibly been, he had no clue. I work in agricultural marketing. My job is to determine the amount of meat that will be derived from individual cow carcasses after slaughter, and before they are split into primal cuts. To determine this, we have to compare the conformation of the animal, or the ratio of muscling to fat, and factor in the skeletal structure of the animal. So, if I apply this to what I remember seeing when I was younger, this creature was absolutely huge, at least 8 feet tall, and weighing easily around 550 pounds. It was tall, but had a slightly more narrow build in the shoulder area width than the animal in the Patterson film. It was still too large to be a human, wider and thicker muscle than a man, but not as stocky as the Patterson footage. That is why I say it may not be heavier. I will try to explain what I saw. While returning home from a day of walking in a clear cut looking for Indian artifacts, the clear cut was located at the foot of the southeast end of the Horse Range Mountain near Loudsville Campground in White County, Georgia. I was driving on a forestry service road when I saw what at first I thought was a bear about 200 yards away, but when I stopped and watched it, I saw that it was not. It walked upright with a slight stoop for about 75 yards down a hill toward a small creek that was bordered by trees and brush. The road crossed the creek, so I thought if I went down on the road, I could see it as it came out the other side, but it did not come out, and I did not get out of the Bronco to go looking for it. I did not hear any sound, and to be honest, I did not tell anybody about it for years until I told my son Eric. I went out in a pigeon on 92711, and what I heard wasn't any animals I'm used to hearing on Pigeon Mountain. It was a deep growl, and then a long mellow scream, and I heard the same noise below my house. I lived just about three miles from Pigeon Mountain on Moon Lake Road, where a couple months ago I heard the same scream on Satelline Road below where I live. I'm going back to Pigeon Mountain tomorrow night and try to see if I hear it again. Two friends of mine and myself were pushing a cave lead in Cornfield Sink on the east side of Pigeon Mountain. We came out of the lead at about 3 a.m. and started gathering our caving gear together for the half mile walk to the car. As we were about to leave, the strangest call I have ever heard came from the opposite side of the sink from us. Distance would have been about 900 feet. The three of us have been woodsmen all of our lives, but none of us have ever heard a call like that. It sounded like four different animals in one, all powered by what must have been an enormous set of lungs. Hearing the vocalization, the three of us looked at each other, saucer-eyed and not saying a word. Each of us was hoping the others would pipe up with a logical explanation for what we heard. Needless to say, since we had been planning to leave anyway, we beat a hasty retreat to the vehicles. Hi. Me and my friend have been hearing some weird stuff while we were hunting. 
My friend heard the sounds first. Then I heard them the next evening, right before dark. The sounds sound like something is screaming, but kind of high-pitched screams. My friend also thought he heard something throwing stuff around his tree stand. The reason I think it is a Bigfoot is because there is some property behind ours and they have been clear-cutting all of it. I think it has run the Bigfoot onto our property. If I see anything else or hear anything else, I will give you more information. My girlfriend and I traveled to this area at 11.30 that night to build a campfire and relax from the daily grind. She and I didn't have to work Wednesday, so the late hour didn't matter. At about 11.30, we found a suitable site approximately seven to eight miles in. There are only a dozen or so clearings for camping on the trail. Our site was on the trail, a clearing big enough to circle my truck around. It had two other trails at the back corners, one didn't go far before growth took over. The other looked like it might be passable, as far as I could tell. At 1 a.m., I was sitting on the tailgate and my girlfriend a few feet away tending the fire. Then we heard a loud high-pitched scream that reverberated through the dense forest. My girlfriend got scared and asked me what it was. I have been an outdoorsman my whole life, hunting, fishing, camping, and studying animals like a religion. I've never heard of anything like that that can scream. I told my girlfriend to be quiet and maybe it would go off again. The moon was high and bright to be full, not yet. The trail was lit good, so I looked down the trail and I looked the way we came. In the middle of the trail, a large bulky figure stood. The way the light fell on its features, I believe it was facing me from about 30 yards distant. I thought at first it might be a tree or bush but it had a discernible head, arms, torso, and legs. I went and got my girlfriend, not saying anything to upset her. If it turned out to be a tree, she would be mad for teasing her. I looked and the figure was gone. Back of the fire, the animal behind us screamed, same as before, except this time, it sounded just inside the forest cover. Before we could react, a similar, more distant call came from the forest in front of us. Was this the thing I had seen? I don't know. At that, I threw everything in the truck and at my girlfriend's panic. I shoveled sand onto the fire while she screamed hurry. I jumped into the truck and hit out a lot faster than we ever drove in. I was deer hunting on Pigeon Mountain and was following a group of deer when I shot and wounded an almost solid black buck with a large rack. The buck followed a well-worn game trail, and I had trailed the deer by blood drops. It was getting dark, and the train was getting difficult to continue, and I had no light. I had to turn and come down the mountain. I began to feel like I was not alone. They were none of the normal animal sounds, like birds and squirrels, etc. I had heard something coming down the mountain, taking a parallel path that I was taking. I could not see anything. There were limbs breaking, leaves rustling, and then I would hear nothing. I had unloaded my gun for safety and reloaded because I had never heard an animal move through the woods like this one. Myself, one other person and the owner were the only people allowed to hunt in the area, and the terrain it was using was too rough for a human to travel, much less move at the speed this animal was. One minute, it would sound like a raging bull, and the next minute, it would move down the mountain, not making a sound. I heard a grunt and a growl. I was terrified and felt as I was being stalked by something I had never encountered before. When I stopped, so did it. When I moved slow, it moved slow. When I moved faster, it moved faster. I was worried when I would hear nothing. I reached the base of the mountain and had taken a wrong turn and had put myself in front of a large briar patch. It did not let that stop me. I drove through the briars, cutting and scratching myself. I finally reached the safety of my truck and once again heard the grunting noise from behind me. I did not return to look for the buck I had shot or ever hunt in that area again. I did not ever see anything, but something large was in the woods that night. I have not felt safe in the woods since. 
I had hunted, fished, and farmed in that area all of my life. I felt as though I knew all the animals in the woods and the sounds they made as they moved. I was taught to stalk, hunt by an employee who worked on our farm and he had lived in the Smoky Mountains and fed his family by hunting game. I had heard deer grunt before and this was no deer grunting. 